Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen Have you flown lately? Since COVID has started, have you boarded a flight? Have you taken a trip somewhere? Well, you're probably among the millions of Canadians who've decided to kind of stay at home and wait till things settle because there seem to be so many rules and regulations surrounding traveling somewhere, especially on a flight. And of course, you can't even get an, into an airport unless you're doubly vaxxed and you're not allowed in otherwise. But are you interested in flying somewhere? Are you just waiting till this all settles down and things hopefully resume to normal? Well, if you are going to be taking a flight somewhere soon, you might want to pay attention. Recently, the federal government has announced some kind of changes to its labor code, which will mandate vaccines for all employees for all federally regulated industries. And of course, that includes the airline industry. And just to be clear, there are approximately 18,500 employers in federal regulated industries, and together they employ almost a million Canadians. So this is something we need to discuss. So how will this impact your decision if you fly? If, would you be concerned if the pilots on your flight or the, those helping serve you on an aircraft, if you knew that they had to be double vaxxed in order to have that job? especially as we hear about vaccine mandates dropping across the country, why or should this industry retain a vaccine mandate? Well, joining me now to discuss all these related matters is Greg Hill, co-founder of Free to Fly. Greg, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me, Tanya. Okay, so many Canadians may not be familiar with your organization. So please just give us an, uh, you know, a few minutes. Or What is Free to Fly? Well, we're an organization primarily dedicated to the freedoms of every Canadian coast to coast, and it comprises approximately 3,000 aviation workers, not just pilots uh, like myself, but flight attendants, air traffic controllers, maintenance workers. It's the whole gamut. And then most importantly, 38,000 passengers, much like those you've just spoken of, who would like their mobility rights back uh, because, uh, as you pointed out, these these mandates, they're actually already in place for our industry as far as uh, as far as the aviation industry, but it's it's planned to go far broader. So we've been around for approximately a year. We saw that these mandates were probably coming, and there were several of us who got motivated uh, in April of 2020, and then it just kind of exploded from there as more of our aviation professionals as well as passengers got on board. So we've been very vocal, uh, not just about those mobility rights. Of course, those are near and dear to our heart, but mm -hmm. about all of the uh, the freedoms that we seem to have uh, have lost over the past year or two. Well, I recall late last fall seeing videos of, uh, in this particular case, it was of WestJet Airlines, of uh, air pilots and, and airline workers who lost their jobs because they did not adhere to the vaccine mandate that was imposed upon that industry. How many airline workers have been impacted by these vaccine mandates? Well, the mandate themselves uh, themselves impact uh, the the entire sector, but I, I assume what you're asking is how many are on usually unpaid leave, and uh, it's difficult to gauge the number exactly. It would be in the thousands uh, across all of the sectors. Like I said, you know, the most visible one uh, for those that are traveling are the pilots and flight attendants, but of course, there's all the what we call under the wing workers as well as air traffic controllers uh, and otherwise. So. It's, uh, I'll be blunt, it's a smaller number than we would have liked, and I, that sounds counterintuitive, but if you look at what happened in the, in the United States, there was a 15 or 20 percent, let's say, just to take their pilots, for instance, at some of the airlines that said, we're not conceding on this, and, uh, and they're still flying. So, so wow. I guess that's another way to answer the question. So why didn't Canada have a similar pushback? Because you're right, I, I oh, temporarily forgot about that. You're right, there was a huge pushback by major airlines in the United States where there was the grounding of planes, you know, allegations that it had nothing to do with the vaccine mandate and it was merely, uh, you know, weather related. But it was, to most of us, pretty clear that these were, uh, I guess, unvaccinated or unsupporting of vaccine mandate pilots saying, you know, we've had enough and other airline workers. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a clear answer. Like I said, I wish it uh, I wish it was different. Some of it may have been the rapidity with which it was rolled out. Uh, some of it may also be, uh, I don't know how to phrase it other than our culture, cultural DNA, uh, given our history as a nation uh, compared, you know, as, as primarily loyalists going back uh, historically to, to the American approach to things and, and also our um, 
you know, the constitutional and charter framework, I, I would say, are are less robust and uh, and not as strong as, as what you see in the states as well. I think that may have impacted uh, how things played out. Okay, I want to continue this, this discussion right when we return from this commercial break. Please stick around. Welcome back. We're continuing our discussion with the co-founder of freetofly.ca, Greg Hill, a former pilot himself or a pilot himself. Greg, before we went to commercial break, we were discussing, I guess, the similarities and differences with the United States airline response to COVID mandates, vaccine mandates versus the Canadian response. So I appreciate there's a difference in culture and and you know clearly we have a um, coast-to-coast mandate, not even just for the employees, but also for the passengers. You're not flying anywhere if you're not doubly vaxxed and can show proof of that. But there seems to be something more entrenching. I think some Canadians may be comfortable with a vaccine mandate. Some might in this sort of crisis situation. But the federal government is now seeking to enshrine this kind of thing within the labor code. Could you expand on that, please? Yeah, I guess the concern with it really, and as I said, uh, there's interim orders out and that's what's governing. Uh, I'll just speak to aviation for now. That's what's governing our requirement to be vaccinated along with the passengers. And these are updated every 14 days. Um, and there's there's minor nuances and changes that that, uh, that govern it. But when, as you pointed out, when we started here, if you enshrine it in the Canada Labour Code, you're looking at almost a million employees and 18,500 employers. So there was an announcement that went out early in December. It really didn't take hold firmly, from what I could tell, within uh, within the broader media. But what's happening and how this typically plays out is an advisory goes out. It's in what's called a forward regulatory plan. You can look it up and, and, and see it there. And most of the advisories that that get placed in there have been there for sometimes uh, they're, they're placed in there a couple years prior. Uh, the, the most recent one that I can find other than this one, which is called Developing COVID-19 Vaccination Regulations under the uh, Canadian Labour Code, uh, it was put in there December the 10th. The one prior to that was back in August, and most of them were from 2020. So there's two main pieces, I think, that are that everyone should be concerned about. The government has said that they consulted with all stakeholders in December of 2021. Remember that I said it was it was first advised the 10th of December. Right. We all packed it in for Christmas around, let's let's be generous and say the 24th. You've got 10 working days in there to consult the better part of 18,500 uh, employers and at least the unions and other other representatives of the uh, of the employees themselves. Th- this is mind boggling that that would be possible. Further, it's typically released by something called the Canada Gazette One. And this is your right. It's your democratic right as a citizen of this of this country to comment on these things. And so it, it's typically put out via what's called CG1. Then the public gets a chance to interact with their gov- government uh, in a democracy. They go back and after consulting with the stakeholders, and then they move to enactment via CG2. Now, they have said outright in this uh, listing the, uh, the 10th of December that they will likely go straight to CG2 and enactment. So A, wow. I don't feel it's possible for the stakeholders across this nation to have been properly consulted. And secondly, they're bypassing CG1. Now, they may be doing that because there was this release that came out in a rather obscure portion of uh, on the government website, the Employment and Social Development uh, uh, Employment and Social Development Canada on the uh, on the seventh of December, uh, but it, but it's it's been fairly um, it hasn't gotten broad play, and the fact that this is going to be locked in and and uh, just one more point, if I can make it, sure, all of the federal we're talking all federally regulated um, employees, so we're talking banking. Uh, telecom, uh, things like gr- uh, grain elevators, which which wasn't something I would have would have thought of. Uranium mining. There's all sorts of obscure pieces, and more importantly, any business that is vital and essential to those those businesses. So some of these right now have voluntarily put uh, mandates in, but they're also allowing testing and such. If we put this in the labor code, it's there firmly and permanently, and that's why everyone should be concerned about this. So, and I, again, we're going to have a labor lawyer join us later in the program to kind of unpack uh, some of the intricacies of, of this new measure. But once it's there, it's there to stay. Am I correct? 
That's my understanding. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm, I'm grateful you've got somebody on that can speak uh, beyond my expertise, which is more limited to uh, to aviation for sure. But uh, but I'm concerned, and I think every federally regulated employee should be, because this is outside. It's a jurisdictional issue, I would say, and it's also a charter issue. Uh, and the charter portion we've talked about for the better part of two years now, but I think it's also a jurisdictional issue uh, in terms of, of whether this is what they call ultra vies outside, vires outside right. the, the scope of what's uh, what's permitted. Okay, this again seems very shocking to me that this has been done with very few Canadians paying attention when this will impact almost 1 million Canadians and their employment. We're going to continue this discussion with Greg Hill in just a few moments. Stick around. Greg, thank you so much again for joining us. I'm somewhat shocked. There's this new change to the labor code that's in process. It's coming. It's expected any, I guess, week or month now where there will be a vaccine mandate coast to coast if you work for a federal, federally regulated industry. And you brought up, you know, if you work for a grain elevator, grain silo organization or, or mining, telecommunications and your organization or your industry, which is air, air flight airlines. This is a lot of that's a lot of Canadians, nearly one million Canadians will be impacted by this. Why haven't we heard more? Why hasn't there been a big outcry? Well, I don't want to get conspiratorial. I, I did a little bit of research trying to see how much came out as far as news releases, and it, it wasn't a lot. And I think part of it is and I'm speaking more broadly outside the scope, maybe of what we're talking about here. But I think there's a genuine fatigue. There's information overload right now. and you look at where we've been over the past several weeks with everything that went on with the trucker convoy and it provided somewhat of a smokescreen not that it was i'm not suggesting that that the, right. the trucking convoy was anything other than what it was but there's all sorts of things going on behind the scenes that we've got global turmoil and otherwise so so there's it's more than just this piece as far as the canada labor code we, we see all sorts of other bills that are, are rapidly sliding their way uh towards legislation in this country and there's just so much going on. And from a communication standpoint, even as an organization ourselves, and I'm sure you, Tanya, probably find the same thing, trying to get a message across, it's, it's challenging because people's attention span is fairly limited because they're stressed out. They're, they're concerned about everything from what's happening in, in the Ukraine to what's happening to their jobs for those who right. are out of work, the economy and otherwise. So something like this, to be honest, it's... it's uh, you start mentioning acronyms like CLC and uh, ESDC, and people's yeah, the eyes Canadian Labor over. Congress. Well, like I would assume we would have heard from the Canadian Labor Congress or some of the, the larger unions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and we've done a little just peripheral research initially. We've asked our, our own aviation professionals to engage with their unions, uh, with their management, uh, more as a courtesy to say, wow, uh, as a stakeholder, uh, have you been consulted and, and were you part of the process because the government's saying that's what's happened? And, uh, and what we've been able to get to so far, I, I think they've been taken by surprise. Uh, the, the ones that I've talked to, um, they're scrambling right now to try and uh, wrap their head around where this is going. And, and like I said, in aviation, we're mandated already. But once it's in the labor code, you're dealing with a different beast right now. It's not interim in nature, right? Right. And I think part of the distraction when you said there, there's so many things happening, obviously global turmoil, turmoil with Ukraine. But one thing that has distracted many of us is the frequent announcements of this mandate at lifting, that mandate lifting. And across the country, we see that the vaccine mandates are lifting. Your industry, obviously, it's not lifting. However, it seems the federal government is doing something entirely different or is, is going in a completely different direction, which is they're, they're not lifting the mandate for at least aviation industry. But in fact, now they're codifying it, as, as we've, we've discussed, uh, for, for good, for the foreseeable right. future. Yeah, no, and I think you break, bring up a great point there. And and we've, as an organization, used fit phrases like be vigilant, uh, be relentless, because there is a concern, certainly from myself and, and some of my colleagues, that some of what you're seeing in terms of these these uh, mandates at the provincial level being lifted. It's bits and pieces here and there. It's, it's different in every province. Right. But I'm concerned that it's a little bit of, uh, I'll call it breadcrumbs for the hungry masses. It's, uh, it, you know, here's, here's something to satiate you for, for a period, perhaps during the summer when, when the sunshine comes out and it's a little bit warmer. And we've already got uh, 
Dr. Tam talking about the fall and, and what we might see in the fall. So I think people right. need to be concerned about what's coming at the federal level. Don't be distracted. I, I'm not saying be doom and gloom, but uh, we're, we're in a, a battle here, uh, certainly as far as our freedoms go, uh, that I like to call a marathon uh, and, and getting ourselves past just these, these uh, vaccines and the COVID issue. I, I think we're in really in for a long haul and we need to pace ourselves and, and continue to be vigilant about what's coming our way. I think that's a very interesting point, especially as you know, we have heard from Dr. Tam, as you mentioned, she said there, there, you know, be prepared, there might be another variant in the fall. But in the 30 seconds we have left, I mean, you represent, you know, thousands of workers, thousands of of Canadians who want to fly. What does their future look like? Will you ever get a job in the airline industry after this? Well, we like to be hopeful, but but I, I would appeal to Canadians coast to coast. If you want to change, if you want to seize your freedom, this is the nature of dealing with, with a government that's pushing themselves into your private sphere. You have to take agency for your life. You have to stand up for your freedom, speak out, be courageous, uh, and, and make your voice heard. That's what I would say. Okay, Greg, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll have you on again in the future. Thanks, Tanya. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining us now to help us unpack what these amendments to the Federal Labor Code mean for you, perhaps, is Sunira Chowdhury, partner with Workly, an employment and labor law firm. Sunira, thanks so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me, Tanya. Pleasure to be here. So just so that our viewers understand, is it legal for the government to make these amendments to the Labor Code? I think it's legal uh, for now. What, and, I, and I'm saying that because as the tides have been shifting when it comes to vaccine mandates, we have seen them put on us. I mean, we can all go back to uh, the holiday season where we were uh, you know, forcing antigen testing on, on friends and family before we met to just a few short weeks later. You know, we're now sitting in February where vaccine mandates seem to be falling away. So in terms of what's legal, I think it's, it's an interesting question because it really does depend on the month. It depends on enforcement. I, as, as a lawyer, can sit here and say, notionally, things could be illegal or legal. But I think, as, as you'll, you'd probably agree with me, Tanya, that a lot of the law, when it comes to vaccine mandates in this country, have been placed on the shoulders of business to enforce. Right. 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 Um, Whether it's an employer, whether it's that restaurant owner who needs to check my vaccine passport and my name and my phone number before they give me a seat. Who is enforcing this? We are policing one another. So whether or not uh, we have a new piece of legislation that's going to be sitting on all of the new pieces of legislation that we've seen in the last two years, um, whether or not it's going to have teeth is going to be a very interesting question. Yeah. And you. You phrase that very well, whether it will have teeth, because to me, as an outsider looking at this, these new amendments to the labor code, this seems really enshrining the vaccine mandates within, again, government regulated uh, workplaces, which are which which impacts nearly one million Canadians coast to coast. It seems different than the provincial vaccine mandates. OK, you don't want to go to the restaurant. You don't want to show your your QR code or whatever. You don't have your vaccines, whatever. But this this is people's livelihoods and, and not just for a short term. It seems like this could be for a long term. Yeah, I think when you change legislation, that is fundamental. I think what we're going to see on the on the federal side are employees that can't keep their jobs as a result of not getting the vaccine. They are going to be put in a position to either they're going to either be subject to uh, administrative leaves, suspensions, terminations. Some might be terminated for cause. Many will have to find lawyers. Many might not be able to uh, find a similar job, frankly. Because without getting that um, vaccine stamp of approval, some employees are seen as being a bit radioactive and other employers really just don't, out of fear, don't know what to do. So I think this is going to be 
uh, an issue in the courts. It's going to be left up to the judges to decide whether or not imposing a vaccine mandate now where even those who are vaccinated have succumbed to COVID. We know that with the Omicron wave. And this test of reasonableness um, is going to really be put to the test. And I would be shocked if any changes to the Canada Labour Code that do require employees to get vaccinated, I would be shocked if it's not challenged and challenged quickly for that very reason. Right. There are many vocal unions who I'm sure, well, I would hope, I suppose, would jump to the defense of, of, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of their workers being impacted. So if this does proceed and there is this new enshrinement within the labor code, do companies who fall under that federal regulation, do they actually have to comply? I think all federally regulated workers uh, and companies, for example, large telecoms, trucking companies, we've heard a lot about trucking lately, yes. they would. So you, if you fall under a federally regulated industry, you as an employer would have to comply with any minimum set requirements under the Canada Labour Code, including vaccination status, if that does become enshrined within the Canada Labour Code. And when we discuss uh, sectors like you mentioned telecommunications, but like airlines, you know, it's not like there are two vehicles for pilots in this country. You're either flying or you're not. Does, what does this mean for those kinds of employees? I think when it comes to aviation, there's going to be some stricter guidelines uh, when it comes to vaccination because just of the nature of 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 the plane or the vehicle that you're in. So I don't know if we're going to see a lot of um, flexibility in that industry. I think we're going to see a lot of shaking up when it comes to aviation. Um, but unfortunately, to the demise of thousands of workers, to your point earlier, it's really going to shake up that industry. And in a way that's going to be really, you know, really costly to a lot of aviation employees. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.